we're going to have to find a different way to deliver that care. So I came to Indian country. I will tell you this brief story. You know, I'm a well-trained physician. I have the standard pedigree, uh, Ivy League degrees of purported genius. I, you know, all of that stuff. I was the hottest thing on the block. I couldn't wait to lay my hands on an enormously receptive public. I did not want to go to Southeast Asia. Uh, I will not tell you that story at this time. There will not be time for Q&A, but I'm going to sign some books afterwards and we can schmooze then. But, so I came from New York with that kind of geographic chauvinism and arrogance that comes to many Easterners who think that you cross the George Washington Bridge, you have to be immunized against a tropical disease. That somehow <laughs> the Hudson River separates the genius of the intellectual condition from a vast wasteland. <laughs> so I came to New Mexico, 1965. And I was not well received. I, <laughs> I mean, first of all, I was a white man and I was held responsible for everything that had transpired for the last couple of hundred years. <laughs> I came to Indian country, I thought Columbus Day was a holiday. <laughs> Columbus Day is not a big holiday in Indian country. <laughs> Columbus discovered America like somebody sees the keys in the ignition of your car and then drives it away saying they discovered it. This is how Columbus discovered America, in any event. I, things etched away at my certainties by the time I got to Indian country. Uh, people died in spite of my genius and ministrations from diseases that I thought were treatable. For example, people were dying in DTs even though I was treating them. And uh, I knew there was a mortality rate, but I couldn't imagine 25% of the people were dying like flies. I mean, it etched away at my certainties. I was there for about six months, and I was introduced to an old man on rounds. I will show you his picture, if I can have the first one, please. I'm introduced to him. In those days, we had large wards. Those of us over the age of 50, you remember something? You may not see this picture. Graham, are you back there? The first picture. Ah, this is it. I wanted to show you what I looked like in those revolutionary days, this, <laughs> this curly-headed, mustachioed bandito. I am introduced to him on, uh, on morning rounds. He'd been admitted by my colleague in acute congestive heart failure. I was going to be the doc who provided the aftercare because I went to the village from which he came. I'm introduced to him. This is Dr. Hammerschlag. He's going to be your doctor. He could not say Hammerschlag which actually happens with some frequency. Uh, not long ago, I introduced myself to a patient. I said, how do you do? I'm Dr. Hammerschlag. She said, oh my God, is that what I have? <laughs> I have. He says, you're going to be my doctor. I said, yes. And uh, he said, uh, where did you learn how to heal? I thought he meant, uh, where did I get my degrees and credentials? And I recite this litany of academic achievement. I went to medical school here. I am a diplomat with the National Board of Medical Examiners. I've done a rotating internship. I mean, you know, the usual stuff. And he looks at me, this beautiful, beautiful old man, his hair tied in a traditional chignon behind him, oxygen cannula running. He's been digitalized, given a diagretic. I mean, standard treatment for congestive heart failure. He looks at me and he says, do you know how to dance? And I look at him with the same smiling incredulity that you were looking at me, and I say, do I know how to dance? Do I know how to dance? He says, yeah, do you know how to dance? You have to be able to dance if you want to be able to heal. And I, not wanting to be caught short, you know, say, yeah, are you kidding? I know how to dance. And he moves his hand, and I, you know, start <laughs> dancing at the bedside, and he says, oh, that's good. I say to him, do you know how to dance? I don't at the time know that he is a traditional healer, a medicine man. And he says, yeah, I know how to dance. So I motion to him, and he gets out of bed. I mean, the oxygen's still running. 
He's been digitalized. I think he's going to crumble on the spot. And he does a green corn dance at the bedside. And as he gets back into bed, I say to him, will you teach me how to dance that way? And he looked at me and said what had been, until this moment, the most profound teaching about health and said, I can teach you my steps, but you have to be able to hear your own music. Most of us only do the healing dance listening to one tune. We think that the way we learn it is the only way it is, and we fit people into this kind of interesting paradigm. We make the diagnosis, we tell you what it is you have to do, you follow our instructions, and then somehow you get well. We don't promote a lot of relationship, one, because it's uh, not reimbursable, and it, it's not procedural, which generally gets larger remuneration. We don't have ways of learning new dances. We think the way we learn it is the way it is. We hang around with other people who know it the way we got it, and then we are convinced that the way we have it is the only way it is. This is the process of most education, and certainly in medical education. Now, I don't want to demean what it is that we have learned with the technology of our genius. I mean, we can do things now that were previously unimaginable. Forty years ago, cancer was a death sentence. Now it's often a curable disease. We've done some remarkable things. But it must be clear to us all that no increase in the number of PAs, nurse practitioners, docs, is going to make diddly squat difference in the treatment of disease in the world. The great advances in healing have never come from providing more interventional care. They come from prevention. They come from discovering what causes the illness and how it is that we are going to intervene, how it is we are going to prevent its outbreak. How many ways are there to do the dance? How many ways are there for us to hear the music? We are well trained in the science of medicine. I don't want to demean that at all. But I'm suggesting that there are some things that uh, we really don't know about. We train good head. We teach people the science. It's one of the unfortunate concomitants of the scientific, technical, industrial revolution of the last 200 years that we attribute all of our successes to the genius of our mind, to the head, what it is that we know. The most profound lesson that I learned in coming to Indian country was that if you're going to be healthy, which as I share with you, I did not learn in medical school. We had one hour in nutrition. If you want to stay healthy, you have to be in balance. In Navajo country, health is defined as a balance between what you know with your head, what it is you say with your lips and do by your actions and what you feel in your heart. This is health. It is the balance between mind, body, and spirit, the head, the lips, and the heart, the world of knowledge, the world of action, the world of emotion.